that uh, uh, where compliance is required, and that uh, the one that is uh, in addition to ozone, of course, is the um, is the MAT standard, mercury and air toxics standard. And uh, John Lemkuler, the commercial manager of uh, brominated performance products from one of our um, longstanding sponsors, uh, Great Lakes Solutions, is here to talk about that. Just watch your step up here. Yeah, it's a lot easier. Oh, good morning. Um, I can't say that I won't mention the clean power plan because it is written on one of the slides, but I'm not going to speak about it in any kind of detail whatsoever. So uh, I think that's been done fairly well so far this morning. Uh, I did want to open up. Uh, we just recently finished the World Series. I think everybody saw that. If any of you here from Missouri, you're probably pretty excited about it. If you're here from New York, maybe not so much. Uh, but I usually try to find something to open a discussion that's a little bit more on the lighter side or not necessarily topic related and seeing a New York team that wasn't the one people are accustomed to seeing necessarily in a World Series. Um, I went back to a Yogi Berra quote, which kind of ties into these things I think pretty well, which is how you plan for these things, what you do with the regulations, how you're implementing technology, all of that. And the quote that he had was, if you don't know where you are going, you might wind up someplace else. So for the most part, I think that seemed fairly appropriate with a lot of the things that, uh, that the industry here is forced with looking at, with regulations, with the litigation, with everything else that comes in. But primarily, my discussion here is around bromine derivative materials for MATS compliance. Um, you've probably seen me give this, this presentation a few times here at Power Experts. I do have some updated uh, data and slides. So uh, it won't be the exact same thing, and the things that are a little bit more repetitive, if you've seen them, I'll try to get through them a little quicker. Uh, Great Lakes Solutions, or Chemtura, is a, is a bromine producer. We produce the brominated derivative products that are used in a lot of the technologies. Uh, our particular group is part of our industrial engineering products group. Uh, we're a $2.2 billion company and uh, headquartered in Philadelphia. So just very little there about us. And, okay. All right, here we go. The technologies that are, that are being used for mercury control, as you can see here I highlighted in this slide, many of them do have bromine related with them in some way, shape, or form, primarily for oxidation of the mercury if you have low halogen uh, subbituminous uh, coals. Uh, that, uh, that don't have a lot of halogen to help with the oxidation process. Um, there are those that use calcium bromide, there are those that are using sodium bromide, and then the, uh, the CBNI te uh, technology that uses uh, hydrobromic acid. But for the most part, a lot of the successful technologies that we're looking at here do, uh, do require uh, bromide as, as one of the elements of those technologies. Uh, basically, that bromide can be added in different places. Primarily, it's added uh, with the coal into the boiler to get oxidation at that stage of the game. Uh, and again, the, the focus is converting from elemental mercury to, to a form of mercury that can be captured downstream. Um, there have been some studies of balance of plant issues by EPRI. Uh, they provided me with, with, uh, with that latest report, so I've got some summary there that, uh, that uh, has some pretty good information and some other data that doesn't necessarily have strong correlations, but some pretty good trend information as far as people that are using bromide now and what they're seeing. Uh, and these, this, these technologies are very, fairly successful in, in, uh, in the mercury removal that they can achieve. Um, bromide for MATS compliance. Uh, this is a slightly different slide than what I usually would have, but I think what I tried to do here was just show flexibility in how bromide helps things with, with what you're trying to do. You have a lot of different regulations you're trying to meet. Bromide gives you a pretty good uh, ability to be a little more flexible with other technologies for other, other pollutants that you're dealing with. But let's say you're trying to employ a carbon uh, approach to your, to your capture. By using bromide, you have the potential to reduce your, your plain activated carbon. 
uh, use or to reduce maybe your brominated activated carbon if you have enough carbon for capture and you need more halogen for oxidation. Uh, that would also help improve if you're selling ash as far as the carbon that potentially could, uh, could impact your ash sales. Um, it has been demonstrated uh, in some plants where they have fairly high LOI in their ash to use that carbon as a capture mechanism and then they're adding oxidant in the boiler to, to get the, the necessary oxidation and then they use that unburned carbon for its capture. Or you can also even reduce potentially if you have a ESP or another particulate control device that is fairly loaded up to begin with, by adding more solids to that you potentially could be having other issues. Bromide will help you reduce that amount of solids you have to add as far as injection. If you're using SCR for your oxidation, SCR is primarily there for NOx. So if you have that bromide, you can reduce any catalyst depletion possibly that's, that's going on for oxidation of the mercury. Uh, you could get potentially higher efficiency oxidation, and you, you can do that with fairly low levels of bromide addition. So if you're concerned about balance of plant issues, you really don't have high levels of bromide that you'd be adding to, to get that necessary extra oxidation. And then you also have the reduced potential of your SCR not being able to do exactly what you have it there for, which is NOx control. Um, with the current situation of demand, um, we've, we've seen earlier this morning, you know, lower demand on electricity. That means a lot more, you know, shifting of load and, you know, fuel blending, different things going on. Uh, this would give you another lever to pull when you have those fuel blends or you have those load changes going on in your facility to adapt to, to meet the regulations. And then it would also give you a buffer for control. If you're rioting that thin line, if you're pretty close to being compliant and you just need a little bit of extra to give you a little bit more of a, of a window to operate more, more uh, confidently, a little bit of bromide with a little more oxidation may give you that, that needed uh, buffer. Uh, this is where I told you I have the clean power rule on here. So um, basically, this is just to highlight there are lots of different other regulatory pressures that you're dealing with. Bromide just gives you that flexibility to do some other things where mercury maybe will not be as big of an issue and you can focus on the parts of your plant that maybe are more of a concern. Um, that includes everything from the coal combustion byproducts, what you have to do with your ash, and then of course the latest, the steam electric uh, effluent guidelines that have just come out. Obviously, if you have FGDs, you're going to have to deal with, uh, with your effluents there. Bromide now may not be as big of an issue depending on what you're doing to deal with your, your wet FGDs. Okay, the balance of plant and corrosion studies. Um, <clears throat> this is just a summary. Like I said, EPRI has been doing a survey of plants using bromide, and they've come out with their latest uh, version. So if you were in Chicago, you saw I had some data like this. I've just basically updated it to, from, from their most recent survey. They've had 85 units in the survey. Uh, only 14 of those have basically done parametric testing, so their focus was on the ones that were operating with bromide for, for greater than a year. Uh, so 71 units. Of those, 47 of those units were Section 45. If you're familiar with the Section 45 uh, tax credit rules, a lot of those units are using bromide. Uh, 19 were primarily directed for state regulations, and then five were using kind of a combination of the Section 45 for the... Uh, uh, for the tax, the tax credit purposes as well as meeting regulation. Uh, in, these, in this study, they still really haven't found a smoking gun to say bromide is an issue. And when I go to the next slide, there's lots of different trends that kind of are showing itself that are very interesting. Again, none of them just putting their finger, finger on, on a cause. But they looked at all the coal handling equipment. They looked at the furnace. They looked at the duct work. And basically what they saw, as you can see in the graph there, the air heater was cold side of the air heater was primarily where they really saw the most impact. Uh, they did have five units that report, reported corrosion, but they were kind of anomalies. One of those units, um, the, the corrosion didn't start on the outside and work its way in, so it wasn't totally conclusive that the bromide was causing that. It could have been another issue. There was one issue where they looked at where they actually analyzed for chloride, but they did not see any bromide at the corrosion points. So their, their assumption was it wasn't bromide necessarily there that was, was uh, to point to the issue. Uh, they had one issue that was operating below sulfur, sulfuric acid dew point. That's obviously going to become an issue. And then um, they had some mechanical corrosion issues in one unit, and uh, there was one unit that was actually seeing corrosion prior to the bromide addition. So, uh, there are a lot of factors, but they, they did a pretty good job of getting as much data as they could from the units that are operating. 
this is just kind of a summary of those trends. Okay, so if you're dealing with, if you're using bromide now, you're thinking about using bromide now, this kind of pulls up some of the trends that they saw. Again, nothing that specifically says, yes, this is the potential issue, but lots of good trends. And I think the big one really is coal type. That was a really good trend, I think, where they saw corrosion, 35 of the 36 used PRB or some sort of a blend, okay? And where they didn't see corrosion, most of those were burning, burning bituminous or lower levels of bromide addition with PRB. So I think what that the trend there is, is if you're used to dealing with sulfuric acid and other acid gases, you're already operating in a situation where you're going to be probably clearer of that to begin with. If you're operating in lower halogen coal, you may not be taking those steps because it's not as big of an issue. You, you add now a halogen that is a different situation, now that ability to run a little bit uh, less controlled is not is not out there anymore. Uh, on the coal handling equipment, three of 18 where they added upstream to the pulverizer showed some corrosion. Wasn't quite sure what happened there. Where they did not see corrosion is where, they was, where it was prior to bunkering. However, they did state there that that really hadn't had all the inspections, so they were, they were pending some of the future inspections on the bunker areas. The air heater and the gas temperatures, Again, where they showed corrosion, 29, 29 of those reported no air heating, 16 reported load changes, so a lot of up and down where you have those temperatures fluctuating quite a bit. Again, just like with the cold type, it, it, it basically goes back to if you're dealing with the halogens or with the acid gases already, you're, you're more aware and your system is probably better set up than, than if you're not and, and you start seeing that happen more. Where they did not see corrosion, they had enameled baskets, which are showing to be pretty reliable as far as corrosion resistant, uh, although there is, they would like to see some more data. And there were only two that did not have corrosion that reported any kind of load changes. So again, these are plants that are running a little more flat out. You don't have the up or down disruptions. In the boiler, one unit showed some corrosion, but again, that showed chloride and no bromide present at that point. And then when you look at no corrosion, you wouldn't really anticipate, given those conditions, to be seeing it. So uh, on the bromine addition rates, on a dry basis, they did the measurement here. The units that show corrosion were anywhere from 10 to 350 parts per million of addition. When you look where there was no corrosion, the range was 10 to 440 parts per million. Okay, what's, what's the big difference there? Again, one of the differences is the type of coal that was being burned and then when you look at the average of the use is fairly, fairly similar, the median not too much different. Um, when you look at the corrosion where there was corrosion and they were burning PRB, 34 of the 53, the largest additions were 100 to 150, but where they didn't see corrosion it was even higher. So again, it, there's lots of things here showing interesting trends, nothing that's a smoking gun, but for the most part very interesting trends on what you can look at and how you need to operate. Uh, with the Section 45, there's an additional additive that's used there that does contain chlorine. But again, 27 units showed corrosion and 25 did not. So no real smoking gun there again, but where they did not, 16 of those were bituminous units. Um, activated carbon or brominated activated carbon injection, they've looked at that now too. They showed more of an issue injecting upstream of the air heater, which Again, somewhat makes sense when you're injecting a solid there where you have the potential for those solids to settle out on a surface somewhere, and then if you have condensation of acids or if you have something else like that going on um, where you're not doing as much soot blowing, now you have a surface that can hold that acid, hold it right up against that metal, and that's where you're going to start seeing the big corrosion issue. And then with the air heater, again, the materials of construction, they want to see some more data, but for the most part, from our experience as well, looking at coated materials, coated materials with bromides usually hold up pretty well, provided you're using um, a, a, the right material coating and that that coating has been applied properly. Um, the proposed corrosion mechanisms here, again, nothing really hardcore identified, but you have all these things. You can have the, the, the condensation because of dew point of the acids. Uh, you could get... Uh, absorption of that HBr in sulfuric acid, they're fairly soluble. Um, you can get salt formation where you have, again, a cycle where you have a temperature going up and going down where you're getting salt deposition and then, then uh, condensation and now that salt on the surface acts as a corroding ag agent. Or you could have gas phase corrosion. Again, you wouldn't necessarily expect it at these conditions, but it is one that is possible. 
Uh, we did some corrosion studies, and I presented this data back in Chicago, but I thought it would be helpful to do it again. Uh, we've got copies of them out there at the table. If you want to look at them, that's fine. If you'd like to talk to me about them, I can explain to you some more about what our, our folks looked at. But basically, we looked at 90-day tests at 20 and 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, some of those coupons had welds. Uh, basically, we looked at a carbon steel, different stainless steel, and a, and a duplex alloy uh, with calcium bromide. And then we looked at liquid vapor and a mix of liquid vapor submersion to show if you have issues at the, the interface there of the liquid and the vapor or if you have any concerns with your, your, with your equipment at that point. And um, basically, for the most part, when you look at the studies, the total, uh, total li liquid uh, immersion, when you see that big blue line, that's carbon steel. And that's still less than 1.5 mils per year of a corrosion rate. Again, it depends on what your application for that metal is, but for the most part, two mils per year for most, most equipment is not, is not a, a bad thing when you're looking at corrosion rates. It just depends on what you're using it for. Uh, but when you take that lower level where the stainless steel and the, uh, the duplex alloy and you break it out, that's the bottom graph there, uh, you can see that very, very low corrosion rates, and they did very well even in a total liquid, liquid immersion environment. If you look at the vapor space, virtually no corrosion. Again, we're not at temperatures here that are going to do a lot of things to break this down and get a lot of HBR production, but for the most part, if you're just talking about in the front end of your system where you have a calcium bromide tank, where you're adding it to uh, your belts or doing something like that, calcium bromide is not really showing to be a big issue as far as corrosion up to 50 degrees C. And you can see there the solutions were very clear. The coupons looked very good. Partial immersion, if there was a bigger issue, potentially because you have liquid and vapor, that would show itself here. For the most part, what we saw is what, what uh, we thought we would see, which is it's not total vapor and it's not as bad as total immersion. It's somewhere in between because you have a little bit of both environments exposed to the coupons. But for the most part, again, carbon steel was the one that had the issue, but still way less than even one mil per year on a corrosion rate. So you can see the solutions did pick up some color, and there were some, some surface uh, corrosion evidence on the uh, coupons. But for the most part, if you have a tank that you're using that's, uh, that's stainless, or you can actually even use uh, tanks that are, uh, that are lined, lined tanks, lined FRP, things like that, as long as they can handle the density of calcium bromide, you don't have an issue. When you're adding it to your belts and things like that, even your metals shouldn't be seeing too much of an impact. Summary and conclusions, uh, bromide benefits. Obviously, there are benefits to the technologies for mercury control. They are low operating and capital costs. They're easy to put in for the most part in short time frame if you determine that that's what you need to do in your system to be compliant. You do have the ability to use some calcium bromide to reduce your carbon usage, which would also help if you're using fly ash or if you're selling your fly ash. And then you have the ability to adjust with the, the ever-changing plant conditions. And I think that's probably one thing that necessarily wasn't as big of an issue when you had plants running full out on a more consistent basis, but as we've seen over the last few years, is a bigger issue. Uh, looking downstream with the EPRI study, and again, I give them a lot of credit there, Katie and uh, Nanda, they're doing a good job with that, looking at the balance of plant issues. Um, for the most part, they really haven't attributed anything to bromide, but again, I think the more that they see over time and they see the data, uh, it's very interesting to see the trends that are popping up, especially with the kind of coal you're using and how you're operating that plant. So if you're using a PRB and you're adding bromide and you're starting to see corrosion and you want to start blaming it on something, bromide is probably your cause, but you probably have some abilities there to tweak how you're running as well to, to, to still be able to get by using it and not have the issues. Um, the air heater temperatures, uh, again, they did mention in, in, in their report that using some different soot blowing tactics were good when they were using carbon to avoid having that solids build up on the metal surfaces and then where you have the ability to trap condensed acids, that's, that's shown some benefits. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the uh, low sulfur coals, air heater temperatures, making sure you're, I guess that's the other thing too, if you are using bromide to keep good control or good, keep a good watch on what you're doing in your system, what your temperatures are. Again, maybe years ago that was less of an issue because you were running that thing full out and you didn't have those up and downs. When you do have those temperature changes now, you're going to run into a big issue if you start condensing acid out. And then um, 
on our tests of the pre-boiler bromide impacts, uh, we didn't really see a whole lot of rate uh, of corrosion rate issues. I don't really think for the most part, even in the worst case with the carbon steels, they weren't overly aggressive to, for the most part for what I would consider uh, reasonable corrosion rates. Again, depends on how you're using that equipment and, and what you need to do as far as your maintenance. But the, the carbon steel had the biggest effect. Stainless steel duplex did very well. Um, and then the temperature effects at higher temperature, we did see a little more, but again, you would expect to see that. I don't think necessarily you're operating at those rates, uh, those temperatures all the time. And then really no impact to the welds, uh, really, except, uh, except in the liquid, uh, liquid immersion. Um, if you have any questions, again, we're here. I've got studies. I'm more than happy to hand those out. They're out on our website. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn or something, again, as you have future issues moving down the road, I'd be more than happy to discuss those with you here. And that's all I have. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, I'd probably have, I can take a, a question or two if anybody has any. Okay.